Somebody pray for me. I'm about to, I'm about to give the word. Brother, would you pray for me right now? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity that you give us tonight to be gathering in this place to worship you and to give you the honor and everything that you deserve to receive from the people that you have transformed. I present you, my sister, your servant tonight, who is going to bring that word. There is going to be uh, uh, spiritual uh, food for our souls. You start to bring the peaceful word and that word that we need for our lives to be better in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you, Lord. And bless her life. And bless every word that comes from her mouth. And bless us in a mighty way in the glorious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. So um, a few weeks ago, Pastor had uh, mentioned that he'd be away and, if, and asked if I would speak tonight. And you know when he asked me, this doesn't always happen, but immediately the word hope jumped up in my heart. And I said, oh, I already know what I'm going to speak to them on. I'm going to pray on it, but I think I'm going to talk to them about hope. So tonight, um, I entitled this, A Door of Hope in the Valley of Troubling, okay? I'm going to read a passage to you that's from the book of Hosea. Now, the book of Hosea, this is found in the Old Testament between Daniel and Amos. It's a small book. Hosea, he was a prophet to Israel. His name actually means salvation. And during Hosea's time, Israel enjoyed a temporary season of economic prosperity and political peace. But then the nation started to deteriorate uh, rapidly and it was headed towards destruction. I can just stop right there. And does that sound a little familiar to where we are today? <laughs> it might. If you're familiar with the book of Hosea, you'll know that God commanded Hosea to take an adulterous wife, her name was Gomer, in order to illustrate Israel's spiritual infidelity to God. The prophecy of Hosea was God's last attempt to call the Israelites to repent of their persistent idolatry and wickedness before giving them over to the full judgment of their sins. In this story, Gomer ran after other men while Israel ran after other gods, right? Gomer commits physical adultery while Israel commits spiritual adultery. And this brings us to chapter two of Hosea. In this chapter, the prophet alternates between warnings of judgment and then promises of hope and restoration. And by the time we get to verses 14 and 15, God reveals a great contrast to his judgment. Here, God is saying that by his great grace, in spite of her spiritual adultery, he would still call Israel to return. Here's what it says in Hosea 2, 14 and 15. It says, I am now going to allure her, talking about Israel, God's people. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards and I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she will sing as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came up out of Israel. In this passage, when God said, I will lead her into the desert, he is recalling when he brought his people out of Egypt into the desert, remember? To give them his law, and he was leading them where? To the promised land, right? In this passage, he is saying he would again bring Israel out of her, out of the Egypt of her sin, into a new desert, where he would guide Israel, teach Israel, and restore Israel. But the portion of that scripture that really stuck out to me, it was the portion where God stated, I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about that. In the book of Joshua, we read about the Israelites' great victory over Jericho, right? Remember, they marched 
um, around the, the city wall for seven days. And on the seventh day, they marched seven more times. And then they shouted and the walls came down. Remember that story? I'm having trouble turning my page. Here we go. Well, in Joshua 6.17, they were told this. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies. And then they were given a command in Joshua 6.18. The command was this. Keep away from the devoted things. Now, the devoted things, they were um, either items that should be put in God's treasury or they were items that needed to be completely destroyed because they were accursed things associated with the demonic and debasing worship and practices of the Canaanites. They were told in Joshua 6, 18, keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. It goes on to say, otherwise you will make the camp of Israel, Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and the iron, well, those are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. And then in Joshua 7, we learn that Achan, one of the Israelites, well, he actually took some of the devoted things, didn't he? He took it for himself, and because of it, the Lord's anger burned against Israel. But nothing was done to rectify the matter. It was a hidden sin that had been buried. Soon after this time, the, the word says that Joshua sent some spies to Ai. And when the spies returned, they told Joshua this would be an easy victory. Remember, they just had a great victory in Jericho. And this is what they said. Not all the people will have to go against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it. And do not worry all the people, for only a few men are needed, are there. So about three thousand men went up. But they were rooted by the men of Ai, who killed about thirty-six of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. And, and it says this, at this, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Let's think about that a moment. Ai was small compared to Jericho. Yet 3,000 men ran in fear. 1.2% were killed. And fear crept over the hearts of all the Israelites. All of Israel was quick to become discouraged, depressed, and disoriented. And why was that? Well, they feared that the word of their defeat, that it would spread, and the Canaanites and other people in the country would hear the news, surround them, and wipe them out. In response to this defeat, Joshua, he tore his clothes, he fell before the ark of the Lord, and, and the elders of Israel, they did the same thing. They all prayed, they all mourned, because they had lost the blessing and guidance of God. And then the Lord responded in chapter 7, verse 10, saying this. He said, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen, they have lied, they have put them in their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. God told Joshua, stand up. In other words, Joshua didn't need to beg God to change his heart towards Israel. God loved Israel. He was for Israel. Israel needed to change her heart before God. That's what he was saying. In Joshua 7, 13, God said, you cannot stand against your enemies until you remove the devoted things. 
You know, we learned something really important here. We see here that when God deals with a particular area of sin, and when his people resist his conviction, it's actually his mercy that makes them fail in battle. Do you see that here? Remember, God's heart was toward Israel. He loved Israel. He was for Israel. And as we read on, the Lord helped Israel uncover that it was Achan who had taken the, the devoted things. You know, this is a good reminder to us that secret sin on earth is an open matter to the Lord before the Lord. Amen. And it's interesting how hidden sin seems to hold special power over people. Have you noticed that? God instructed Joshua and the Israelites by saying this, He who is caught with the devoted things shall be destroyed by fire, along with all that belongs to him. When Achan was taken into the valley of Achor, Joshua asked this question, Why? Why have you brought this trouble on us? You know, we're looking at it from afar. How much better it would have been for Achan to just simply walk in obedience to God, right? In the first place. How much better it would have been for him to remember the regret of sin before he sinned rather than after. How much better it would be for us as well, right? The word says that Joshua and the Israelites burned everything up and that place has been called the Valley of Achor ever since. That's Joshua 7.26. On a side note, I want to mention that after the Israelites repented by dealing with the disobedience in the Valley of Achor, Ai was delivered into the Israelites' hands. That's because repentance brings deliverance. You know that, church? So I want to go back to Hosea 2.15. God said, I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. According to that passage right there, it says, God makes the valley of Achor a door of hope. Do you know what Achor means? Achor means troubling. The, the valley of Achor, that means the low place of troubling. Have you ever been there? It's in a valley, a, a low area of land, not a mountaintop. It's in the place where you feel crushed and overcome and overwhelmed. Have you ever been there? Sometimes the valley of troubling comes from sin and disobedience, like with Achan's sin, to be honest. So the valley of Achor, it can be a place where disobedience is dealt with. The Valley of Achor, that can be a place of surrender. It can be a place of repentance. It can be the place where devoted things are thrown into the fire. Devoted things, well, that can be the things that we, you might say devoted things, what's that? <laughs> that can be the, the things we depend on more than we depend on God. It can be pride, self-reliance, Control, devoted things can be offense, unforgiveness, resentment, bitterness. It's the things that we cling to and we are unwilling to let go of it. That's what Aiken did. It can be life controlling issues. It can be the things we covet or ungodly relationships. Devoted things are the hidden Buried things that need to be brought out into the light. Sometimes, troubling comes simply because it's bound to come in this life. Amen? It says in John 16, 33, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. What does the rest say? I have overcome the world. <laughs> the valley of troubling, that can be physical it can be mental, it can be emotional, it can be financial, relational, it could even spirit, be spiritual. Have you ever been there? Interestingly enough, the, the literal Valley of Achor, it is located at the northern boundary of Judah. It actually sits at the main entrance of Canaan, the Promised Land. 
people actually have to travel through the Valley of Achor in order to enter Canaan. Isn't that interesting? Spiritually, sometimes we may find ourselves traveling through the Valley of Troubling on our way to God's promises. And that shouldn't surprise us. But here's the thing. That Valley of Achor, that Valley of Troubling, it is not a place where we're supposed to stay, uh, set up camp and stay. We don't build a home there. When we find ourselves there, we need to remember that it, it's simply a place we're traveling through. You know, the enemy, he will try to convince you that this valley is your new home. Have you ever heard his voice? In fact, I want to tell you, when hopelessness sets in, that's a good indicator that the enemy wants you to agree with his real estate offer. The enemy, he doesn't want us to see the door of hope that is available to us. It's right there. The awesome thing is that whatever the trouble is, God has put a door there, a door of hope. It says so right in his word. And, and this is not a hope like the world uses the word hope. This is not, I hope God will stay true to his promises. <laughs> it's, I know God will stay true to his promises because it's impossible for him to not be faithful. Amen, church? The, the door of hope, well, this refers to dreams, to God-given dreams. And, you know, church, we have a God, he doesn't pour. He's a limitless God. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and as my husband reminds me all the time, he owns the hills too. <laughs> all right? He's a God, he doesn't measure, he just pours. So we can raise our hope. We can raise our expectation and we can agree with hope because our expectation is not in an outcome. Our expectation is in the God of an outcome and he's a good God. He's a good God whose heart is turned toward us. His heart is toward, toward, turned toward you. Did you know that? He's a God who loves us. He loves you. He's for us. He is for you. Can you just say that? God is for me. He loves me. His heart is turned toward me. <laughs> Romans 15, 13 says this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is who our God is. He is the God of hope and joy and peace. The scripture is saying that as we put our trust in him, we are filled with joy and peace and we overflow with hope. What a good God. What a good father. What a great inheritance. Amen? Amen. When we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior and we've repented of our sin, that means we've turned from that sin, then it, the word says that we actually become the children of God. And as children of God, we have a great inheritance. So whatever, whatever trouble God's people experience, no matter what it is, they can rejoice with hope because God has put a door there. Revelation 3.20, it says, this is Jesus speaking. He says, here I am. I stand at the door. And knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Sometimes people think that Jesus is talking to the unbelievers, but he's not there. He's talking to the church. This is not an invitation for repent for uh, um, salvation. That's not what this behold, I stand at the door and knock. This is an invitation for intimate table fellowship with the King of Kings and the Lord of no the Lords. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Not only does Jesus stand at the door, he actually is the door of hope. <laughs> what, what else does the word say about hope? And, and I'm hoping to fill your hope tank right now. I hope I'm doing it. <laughs> this is what the word says. 
Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. Isaiah 49, 23. This is what the word says. For the, I know the plans I have for you, it declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. That's Jeremiah 29, 11. Here's what the word says. This is in Micah. But as for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. Watch in hope. I'm looking for that door of hope. I wait for God, my Savior. My God will hear me. That's Micah 7, 7. Or how about Hebrews 10, 23? Let us hold unswer unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Amen? So the valley of Achor is actually a symbol of better things to come. It becomes a place of rejoicing and singing because there's hope in the certainty of God's nature that doesn't change, his character that doesn't change, and his promises that do not change. Amen, church? And it's a reminder to us that in the valley of troubling, we can bring everything to God and he can actually make it a springboard to victory. Amen? <laughs> God is so good. So in light of this, I'm going to reread Hosea 2.15. There, in the place of obedience, in the place of surrender, in the place where you throw the devoted things into the fire, let it go, I will give her, meaning I will restore to her, her vineyards, her blessings, and her joy. I, who here needs restored joy? <laughs> and I will make the valley of Achor, the low place of troubling, a door of hope, an opportunity to seize my promises. And there she will sing, meaning there will be great joy and rejoicing. Amen? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I think the Holy 